Hi, I'm Zach Kirkup, the business editor at the National Indigenous Times. Thanks very much for joining us for another episode of Indigenous Insights. I'm here today with Wayne Bergman, who's an author of the book, Some People Want to Shoot Me, which is available at bookshops across the country and online. Wayne, thanks very much for joining us for this podcast here today. Thank you, Zach. Would you like to take us back to sort of where the story of, of Wayne Bergman first began up in the Kimberley and, and the journey that, that brought you, I suppose, into certainly much more national prominence? Um, it, more recently, particularly, I guess, starting off with KLC then in that case. Well, I, to tell the story, I wanted people to understand first chapters about my ancestry on Nigana country and how recent that is. I mean, that was the really standout and highlighted issue is that um, back in the 1880s, um, early 1880s, so Alexander Forrest came into the Kimberley exploring and his journals reflected that there were vast grasslands ideal for cattle grazing, that this was an op opportunity to open up the nation. Um, and the consequence of that on, on my mob was there was a pastoral rush and there was land mapped out all over the Kimberleys for pastoral stations, which ended in um, one of my ancestors being um, captured and killed and hung in uh, Rottnest Island. Um, I was really shocked, and the consequence of that was the parliament of the day talked about delivering the full power from the whites to teach the blacks a lesson, that kind of language, and that they the partialists needed to be able to deliver it with their own hands. And so the consequence of that was a lot of Aboriginal people, families along the river, were rounded up, shot, disposed of, or put in chains. Um, there's a lot of historical photos of Aboriginal people building the Derby Jail, the Derby railway tracks to the jetty. It really highlighted what I've been arguing about is traditional owners have been locked out of being business people on their own land for the last 143, 146, probably longer in our area, but it's living memory within the memory of my granny, so my grandmother's mother, and um, my grandmother met and knew of um, her grandmother. Um, so these are people, uh, I didn't meet my grandmother's mother, but these are living memories of everybody I engaged with, had a relationship and grew up with, and taught me things and nurtured me on things. So. I thought it was important that people in Australia realise Aboriginal history is very young. It's a blip in, in, a, in a timeline of consequences. So, And from that, we're trying to map out our place. So um, that was important to tell that because it was a bit like, you know, talking about your ancestry, who do you think I am? Mm. Uh, then as a small child, I had a very ideal, idealistic life. Spending a lot of time, my mother was a single parent. I uh, spent a lot of time with my grandparents, hunting, fishing, having the best childhood. You know, if you ever do one of those reviews in life about what brings you happiness and where were your happiest time, it was certainly those early childhood times, being with my grandparents, hunting and fishing. Um, they were the perfect life. Things I want to teach my kids and I want other kids to have the opportunity to experience country and the environment in that way as well. Then I moved on from there um, in my early teens, mid-teen teenager, got in a whole lot of trouble with police, um, got mixed up with the wrong crowd, did a whole lot of break and enter in Derby, um, got caught and got a community-based order, I think it would have been, got sentenced by three JPs, could sit. Uh, Carol Martin, um, ex-member of parliament, was my probation officer or welfare officer. And I was trying to set myself up with a job because the consequence of that is I ended up out bush working with my dad. But as a, as a child, my dad, so my stepfather, Ferdy Bergman, came into my life when I was probably eight, nine, around that age. And um, 
he was a big influence on my work ethics. So spent a lot of time out bush, learnt how to pull apart windmills. Uh, it was an old bushy. He drilled a Tanami stock route. Um, so you could, I could pull a windmill apart, put it together, look at them, know what size they are. I can remember building concrete tanks. He had the frame, take a day to set up the frame, do the one ton of cement. So f four shovels of, sand, of cement to 18 shovels of sand, something like that. And so that was one ton of cement for the floor and one ton for the sides. I just worked extremely hard in the heat. It was tough life, but um, strong work ethic. And he taught you a lot about sort of gave you that first flavour of business as well. Well, yeah, like he was just ruthless about don't waste any time or energy or or any movement. So uh, as a kid, he got me to pack up the tucker box to go bush once, remember it like yesterday run out of food out bush because I never knew how to pack a tucker box or, or would have been, I don't know, 12 or something, run out of food. And I said, oh, we need to go into town and get some food. And he said, no, they can't afford the fuel. Finish the job first. So he stayed an extra five days to finish the job and he handed me the rifle and I had to shoot whatever I could to eat. Um, he seemed to be able to live off the smell of an oily rag. That and doing the quality of work like being very proud of the quality of work you do, that it's built for a hundred years. So, yeah, he was great role model, I think, for me compared to my mother's early partners or boyfriends um, were extremely violent and um, he was extremely respectful and caring and never raised a hand against mum, so... It was a different value proposition and it was important for a young male, I guess, to have that a strong male figure like that. And so then came down to Perth? While I was in school, I got, I was, I came down to Perth um, from year eight, flew down, experienced city life, Was went to Trinity College and the very first thing that happened in year eight is the school teachers realized I couldn't read or write. I struggled. I can remember in one of the first homework, home period classes saying, write down your times table. And I thought it was mathematics timetable, not your itinerary for what you're doing today. And there's me writing out. I just had no idea. And then trying to work out what the hell's going on, following other kids around the school because they were in my homework home period class, then end up in a science lab and the teacher saying, Mr. Bergman, get me a test tube. Had no idea what a test tube was. So kind of walked into the storeroom looking for a sign and trying to spell it out. And then he storms in saying, what's taking you so long? And grabs the test tube. I was like, wandered out, pretended I knew what I was doing. But that's what the experience was like, you know, being on a, an excavator for the first time, like experiencing that or an elevator. And it was incredible, you know, coming from a small country town and experiencing that. And so you say in the book about that sort of that period of time in your life where you couldn't read or write necessarily and you fast forward only a couple of years really and you go on to become a a boilermaker and then a, a lawyer and, and then the trajectory, trajectory continues to sort of grow for you. How did you find that change from, from that circumstance where? So when I, so I, I played rugby union, broke my collarbone in year nine. Um, so I took year nine off and then played in year 10 and got into the state team and then played in the Australian championships in year 10. Uh, Oh, in the in the beginning of year eleven, for the state under fifteens, and um, went and played in Brisbane. And I came back. Um, I had injured my. I had a number of injuries. I only played a couple of games because the uh, I think ligament in my ankle. Mm -hmm. Came back was very disillusioned and was seeking help. And I went to my basketball coach, 
talk to him. I wanted to improve my English. And he he said, don't worry about it. Just play basketball. And I was shocked and disappointed. And so I went back to the boarding school and rang up mum and said, I want to come home. I learnt my lesson from then. I was too young to make that decision. Mum said yes. So a couple of days later, I was on the plane home and that's when I got in trouble with, with the police. Um, did a whole lot of break and enter. And um, it was from working out bush with dad that I wanted to, it was tough. I wanted to get away and I rang up a friend from school who helped set me up with the boiler maker welder apprentice, which I could already cut steel, weld, measure things. But I went back home, did some contract, started contracting and do, doing my own things. Again, learning how to quote on projects, working out how much you charge, your time, food, fuel. I started to see that you can change people's lives by giving them a job. Do you want to talk a bit more about your time, I suppose, in finding uh, the Kimberley Aboriginal Law Centre, uh, Law Cultural Centre, sorry, and yeah. and how that sort of so, was so, obviously a very con- a strong contributor to where you ended up at, at KLC and, and then onwards. Yeah. So when I did that work as a boiler maker, the wet season came in and I moved from there to Fitzroy Crossing where I dropped duty off and he told me there was this job going at the art centre, Monkaja Arts, and it was being auspices or housed by Garili Adult Education Centre, which was an organisation set up by a number of Aboriginal people, Aboriginal leaders, in particular Aboriginal people who walked off the desert for the first time and met non-Indigenous people that they wanted to learn to read and write. So it was, it was a pretty new kind of organisation but very strong people. So I put in an application and um, got selected to be the Aboriginal art trainee. Um, and then from there, I started to learn to do more written work. Uh, my spelling was terrible. I used to have a sign on my desk where I'd have all the different, uh, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 20, 30, 13, 14, whatever things I couldn't spell on the side of my desk. So when I wrote out checks for the art centre, mm-hmm. I got it right. I would have all these coping mechanisms so you wouldn't know what was going on, put all these things in place. So from there, I got asked to move, or help move the Law and Culture Centre from Broome to Fitzroy Crossing. And then that's how I got into mm-hmm. working for the Kimberley Aboriginal Law and Culture Centre, CALAC. New organisation, the board then interviewed me and a few others, and they chose me. They chose me with pretty much no skills um, to be the coordinator, the senior staff member to help run CALAC. And that's where I developed this incredible bond and relationship with old Joe Brown. Um, He was like my grandfather. Um, He taught me all this stuff about traditional law and custom. We would head out to the desert to Yagi Yaga, Ring of Soak, Balgo, Mullen, Billaluna, these remote WA, the Kimberley communities. And I'd always sit behind him and he'd have a group of men in the front in a circle, speak in language and he'd turn back and ask me, He described me as a little puppy dog that I'd have to follow him around and he'd trained me up. In that period, we were seeing, I saw a number of people that that was uh, walked past the art centre and that who were speared, seeing tribal punishment being dished out. It was just normal. No one reacted. But sometimes tribal punishment went wrong. And the police would try to interfere with it. And they always wanted to punish the people who did the spearing for assault. And the, the strength and requirement of this is all confidential, none of your business. Um, and the police has continued wanting to get hold of people who are doing it to have them charged. And all the elders would just stop quiet. All the middle-aged men would stop quiet. 
And so it that's the law and it's based on a system, a culture, a practice of confidentiality that no one's entitled to know unless you've been initiated through that level and have a different status and understanding to be able to talk in those meetings. Do you, do you think in the, that experience helped develop a sense of that, that real sense of strong of justice and, and fairness and, and equality as well? It was the first thing that catapulted me into, I, I can remember sitting down with a Kimberley Land Council lawyer at the Law and Culture Centre where they explained that customary law is only taken into account in mitigation. So you're already found guilty from the Western law and then if you got punished in a cultural way, that the judge or magistrate could take that account in sentencing and reduce your settings accordingly. And I just thought that was so unfair. And I didn't accept the lawyer's advice. So, I, And it was that point that I said, oh, well, I'll become a lawyer. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to have my own advice. And as the planets aligned, I was trying to reach out and do some schooling at Bachelor College in the Northern Territory. And I had a great lecturer who kind of supported me, a bloke called David Ben. And he rang me up one day and said, Wayne, there's an Aboriginal pre-law course going at UWA. It's run by Charles Darwin Uni, Murdoch and UWA. Why don't you apply for that and become a lawyer? Because at that stage, he was lining me up for a social worker's degree. He says, do an extra year, it'll take four years and become a lawyer rather than a three year and, and get a arts degree or something. And I went, okay. Never really thought I couldn't hardly read or write. And how did you find that experience? I love the knowledge from legal studies, learning about history, learning about all the disputes people have commercially, all the little mechanisms. Um, was really into intellectual property, criminal law, business and marine law. So, you know, I threw myself into that. But because of my literacy level, I would have to work 10 times harder and 10 times longer than everyone else. Numerous four years of staying up to like one o'clock in the morning, every night of the week, just about, like very rarely did I take time so I had to just keep reading and those first years as we all know any student they dump you with all this information to read to be able to get a minimum base understanding of issues and so you tend to be nervous and you want to read everything so you'd be reading like 100 pages to 400 pages cases of judges decisions and you never know what was relevant so you just read the lot so um, it was it actually probably improved my literacy having to read so much. I you know, bought my first computer, the biggest investment. My wife sold her Woolworth shares. She had $2,000 worth of Woolworth shares and she sold that to put in the bucket towards us being able to afford our first computer. And that was, it was so precious. That was the tool to help me get through uni. I imagine the learnings around disputes in business law would have come quite in handy when you moved across to KLC. Mate, the best the best experience was like when I finished my law degree, no one would give me articles. Like I struggled. I got knocked back by everyone. Um, even if you read the book, even Clinton knocked me back, my business partner in NIT, right? And... Um, <laughs> he he confessed to me later, but um, that ALS wouldn't give me articles or didn't give me articles. Legal Aid wouldn't give me articles. The big firms wouldn't give me articles. I even got a phone call from I wrote to BHP, um, Rio Tinto, Shell. Uh, like I was I was trying my best to get articles, and I got a phone. Like, from uh, one of the head lawyers in BHP saying, look, you're better off getting a job for a firm and learning more before you come and work for us. And like 
thank you for the call, but I needed a job and I need to do my articles. And in the end, I rang Pat Dodson, who I am forever grateful for. And he said, ring two people, ring Peter Dowding. He's got a practice and he does family law or Ian Viner, his senior counsel um, in Chambers. And I went, oh, I dodged family law in in uni because I did not want to give any family family law advice. I saw that as a headache. So I rang up Ian Viner and he said, no worries, you got a job, come in. Um, you can start next week because he was just starting a native title case. And Ian Viner taught me how to, what he called, sever the limb at the joints. There's no point soaring through the bone. It's hard work. I'll teach you how to sever. Uh, uh, It's quite a skill as a lawyer to be able to find the gaps in the words and the arguments to sever the issues. Like uh, I came across, I wrote uh, three pages on reasonableness. Um, what was reasonable uh, with case law and references and not for a for a negligence case he was work, working on uh, for for a client and um, like I couldn't imagine how could you write three pages on a single word to define it and how to argue it but yeah I really treasured my time six months in chambers in Francis Burt here and then I then he got me a job to finish off my articles with him with Monty de Curloy, um, with Mark de Curloy. And Mark, again, was a hard, ruthless boss, kept me focused on the issues and how to act in the best interest of your client. And um, so that was an interesting learning curve. But I felt I never fit. I didn't fit. And then uh, during that period, I represented client second-hand car salesmen and... Um, against Aboriginal clients and I didn't feel good about winning all the time. So the opportunity came up then to apply for the job at the Community Land Council. And I came with that, um, that those years of experience then as a practitioner, having to deal with bankruptcy law, having a raids on my files with the clients I had. And it was all interesting. And then understanding what makes people tick when it comes to lawyers Um, unless you've got deep pockets you've got to be very clever in your arguments because lawyers can charge a shitload of money and if you don't have the money to keep them hammering away at the issues you end up caving in so with that in mind and all that experience and my own personal business experience then as a baller maker um I had a new fresh look and I went I went the way of cleaning, restructuring KLC. My, my mark in time as the CEO of the Kimberley Land Council was to deconstruct the organisation to be able to reconstruct it. Um, and, of course, Kimberley Land Council, subsequent to you taking over and becoming CEO, has gone through, went through numerous contentious issues uh, I'm thinking of things like uh, Glen Hill and James Price Point and then the 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 power that was, you know, I think installed in you at that, at that point in time, the CEO after the restructure. Yeah, so so I in those early days, you couldn't get lawyers to work for a land Aboriginal land council, right? We would I, I walked in with twenty three staff positions, um, with a four million dollar budget and five matters in litigation each matter was going to cost a million dollars a year so then you had to run all your staff and I ducked and weaved and juggled and jumped and dodged things and to make it all work created priority systems tried to get extra money created scheduling broke up court cases so you can do them in components so it all didn't have to be done in one financial year. Um, chase lawyers with commercial experience, not native title experience, because we're in litigation. I need I need a good and and uh, the whole organisation really changed and became really efficient. 
and uh, some senior lawyers, I think everyone was a bit shocked that we could hold our own ground. Um, and Argyle Diamonds for Glenn Heddle was the first renegotiation to happen. In retrospect, I probably should have done more to be involved on a hands-on basis, um, but I relied a lot on the advisors and the staff I had there, and I learned everything. How I describe it now is everything what not to do in a negotiation because the, the Argyle's team was far more experienced, controlled the process, knew what they wanted. Um, I was 33, right, um, in the scheme of things, very young, um, dealing with the world's biggest diamond producer, you know, of pink diamonds, and um, um, trying to understand cal financial calculations, traditional owner rights, trying to line up all those things. And the Kimberley Land Council hadn't done a negotiation ever with an operating mind before. So it took took a two-year process to do that negotiation. Um, and during that negotiation, Ord Stage 2 started as a negotiation. So there was so much activity happening in the East Kimberley. Um, and then while Ord Stage 2 was happening, Tanami Gold Mine started operating. So we had some of these major projects on foot. And then we were dabbling with other issues happening. So literally every year there was a major negotiation. Some of them would go for 12 months, 18 months. I think Ord Stage 2 took about four years altogether. Um, and dealing with successive governments. And, and while you're doing, while you're negotiating these, these are like, superannuation funds for traditional owner families so they're intergenerational impacts you only get one chance to get it right very hard to fix things up after and dealing with another 20 odd native title claims across the kimberley of five of which was in the in court in trial and meron gadgerong when i came on board just came down from the high court and set precedents and, and I, what I learned from that was that there was no Indigenous leadership, no think tank to come together to talk about the consequences of getting it wrong. In, in, in the full federal court, the Meron Gajrong decision said Aboriginal people don't own minerals. It was devastating and that was reaffirmed in the high court. And, uh, and um, it should have been a matter of fact if your traditional laws and customs show you traded with minerals. Um, it should have said, yes, you own it, but now it's subject to compensation. And it, it's created all these legal... Pre and so it was really important at a national level. That moved me more into a national... I remember this young 33-year-old calling a phone hookup with Noel Pearce and... Uh, David Ross, Peter Yu, Pat Dodson, um, there was a few other people on there, and doing a briefing on the phone about the consequence of this. And I remember Noel Pearson's reaction is, who the hell allowed these things to go to a court decision? I was like, oh, I don't know. But what I learned from with Ian Viner, don't raise an issue if you've got a chance of losing it. You know that you can argue, you can have a hundred arguments about win, trying to win, but you only need one or two to win the ultimate case. Do not create a big list because you'll lose some of them, if not most of them. Everyone, the con overall consensus in in the book certainly seems to be that you're one of the toughest negotiators uh, in the business uh, out there at the moment, and I, did, I assume that started well back then when you had all these matters uh, at hand. You were, working towards making sure there was the very best outcome at KLC. The idea, was that ever overwhelming? Did you ever find that particularly confronting? I mean, I know there was a lot of a lot of stories in, in the book as well about your time at KLC, particularly leading up to James Price Point and then all the issues that came with the James Price Point. I, I think 
all those early agreements trained me up and skilled me for James Rice Point. Um, and Argyle, Argyle negotiations in particular, um, that all prepared me for a negotiation. I don't know if I'd be the toughest negotiator. All I tried to do is get good information. And I understood how to get good information, you need to be resourced to get good advisors. Um, and then having good advisors, um, they can tell you black and white what can companies afford to pay and what's fair and reasonable. And then there's a commercial and political judgment about how to close the deal. Um, in one negotiation for um, trying to trying to settle a traditional owner, the CEO of, a, of the company, we, we had this ambit claim and we're still trying to push it up as high as we can. And the CEO came into the room. We went out, he came back in the room and said, right, I put on the table something real. We put the same number on the table and he said, Wayne, I know I can pay you that, but I'm telling you I'm not bloody paying you that because I got shareholders to look after and I got debts to pay. So I'm going to leave the room now. You come back with a reasonable position and we'll do a deal today. And um, and then, you know, with advice about what can thing we've we kind of came back with a reasonable number and it was happy days. We did the deal that afternoon and uh, it turned out to be, you know, a good number that provided good financial compensation. I wasn't, wasn't high, it wasn't too high that the company could still afford to pay it, um, had some compromises in it, but it allowed people to get on and live with the result of that operation. You talked earlier before about having to deal with changes in government and, and, and things like that. In 2008, the Barnett Liberal government came into office in Western Australia, and then in 2009, then Premier Colin Barnett very clearly uh, signalled that the James Price Point development uh, in the Kimberley was going to go ahead and the government was going to move towards taking very drastic action. That would have seen the land effectively taken out of the hands of the traditional owners and moved entirely into government administration effectively. That obviously would have caused significant, did cause a significant community disruption and then national attention that sort of ballooned from there. All the while, KLC was in the middle of this in, in the, I think it's the battle line and the front line at one point in time that it was called. How did you find that that circumstance? I mean, that, that would have been thrust into the national spotlight there, this massive issue, this massive development, government pressure, and there's KLC. It kind of... It kind of was really surreal in one sense because I was trying to create economic opportunity to empower Aboriginal people and how do you do it? And prior, so during the Labor Party's term, we were starting to be consulted with all the offshore oil and gas company and there were more than Woodside, Shell and Impex. There's a whole lot more explorers off there. And then I started to start say, my God, if we don't get control on this, we could end up with LNG plants all along the Kimberley Coast. We need a process to manage this, get them in one paddock, one area where, where you have better systems to control it. And so I reached out to environmental groups because we kind of had on again, off again relationship. But ultimately, I thought we had strong relationship with them. And as a result, we signed a memorandum of understanding where the environmental groups, I think from memory, Australian Conservation Foundation, um, the Conservation Council WA, World Wildlife Fund for Nature, WWF and Environs Kimberley, and might have even been a little one, Save the Turtles. They all signed this MOU saying they support one location. And I thought, Eureka. But I was trying to represent my mob because I had... I had some groups saying, we want our own LNG plant on our country. And I had no idea where the best location was. So the MOU recognised environmental groups support one location, but um, I had to take instructions from traditional owners. And in during that time, we were uh, in heavy negotiations with impacts uh, for Merritt Islands. 
as they were doing their environmental assessments. Uh, then there was Gallup resigned, Alan Carpenter became Premier, and he called a snapped election, which in retrospect was the wrong call, got rolled by Colin, was brought back, Colin became the new Premier. And Colin took his time in getting sworn in and taken up. I can remember going to Parliament House and talking to him, and he was very interested. He was being lobbied by Impex and by Woodside. This was something like September after he got elected in August, I think. And he um, was playing his cards and he made some hardline public statements. The result was I had to start reaching out to the Commonwealth to help. And the, the consequence of that is Jenny Macklin offered an olive branch and went and saw the Premier and had discussions that the Commonwealth would help fund Kelsey's engagement in that if he would hold off while we negotiated a heads of agreement and essentially everyone came together and I had everyone in the in the room um, and at this stage there were various there was like four locations left the focus this is locations for the development locations for the development Gordon Bay James Price Point North Head and a place near Camden Sound um, Camden Sound traditional owners took it off the list Gordon Bay was taken off the list North Head wasn't appropriate because they had to remove move Aboriginal communities on outstation. Uh, the business community of Broome lobbied for James Rice Point because they'd be beneficiaries of the opportunity as well. And so it became James Rice Point. The only traditional owner group in the Kimberley that consented to look at their place was um, Wannabal Gumbra um, up in Truscott Air Base. I can remember begging Barnett to keep that on the list. And he said, no, the environmental groups will make a big issue of it. I think it'll be James Price Point. It's livable. And Malcolm Douglas, I was in a meeting during the Labor time where Malcolm Douglas also said something similar, that he wouldn't be happy, but he could live with an outcome south of one arm point on the coast, but anything north that he would make a big noise about it. It That was setting the scene, right? And, that, and it became... Um, a very pro protracted process to try and negotiate. There were baits and switches all along. I got to know people really well, but we were well-resourced, was comprehensive. Um, but walking, they, the government decided to be tied on its purse and didn't keep the rest of the traditional owners on the coast involved in the process. So everyone then broke away and started doing their own things. And I think that gave impetus for groups to start splitting. And the families within groups got offended by things. So they started saying publicly, and it was became a very tough process and project to try and get certainty on. In the end, we hit a point where it had to be put to a vote, and which ultimately was a voted yes by a majority of 64% of the traditional owners present. And we were criticised for that. Some members of parliament said that's not an Aboriginal way to make decisions. Why Why isn't? Like, um, people were just trying to find stones to try and or, or throw it at us or pull it apart. That theme of Aboriginal economic development, making sure Aboriginal people had a a role, a meaningful part to play in their own economic independence is a strong part of the theme of your, of your book and, and your life. Uh, after everything that happened with James Price Point and moving on, obviously you decided then to move significantly towards the much more business oriented part of your life. And Well, I, I couldn't see, you see, during James Price Point, I couldn't see, and my elders around me said, if I can do something about it, because we talked about KLC being established during Nukumba and the stop there, and some of my elders said, well, what did we win from that? What did we gain from that? And we talked about, well, can we, can we create an obligation for employment, business, and participation and get them to work with us better about environment and heritage protection? Like, can we do that? And so James Rice Point 
um, was this a combination of all those years of negotiations for the trying to get the best way? Like it's yes, it does. Uh, we were criticised to say you shouldn't have to sell your native title rights for jobs. Well, no one's lining up giving us jobs unless we do a deal, right? Um, even when we've done a deal, we're still fighting with the companies to give us a job or a contract and meaningful contracts, not like, you know, picking up rubbish or... Standing like, around money. Yeah, like meaningful things because our, that that's why that history in the book is important because all these families in our region have been locked out of the economy, haven't used our land for economic participation. The land was taken off us and given in, in the majority of cases to pastoralists to run their businesses. And we're, we started doing that ourselves. So uh, that job and participation became really fundamental. And at the end of my time, I just started to get bored. I needed a, more of a challenge. And I said to the board, I was resigning. And they said, well, we don't want to lose you. What do you want to do? And I said, I want to create a business foundation. So the last two years of KLC, of my time there, we went through a process to assess and analyze creating Umbridge Brew, which means people in Bardi Foundation that native title groups can be members of. And then the working arm underneath Cred Enterprise, which is also a charity, actually went out and did the commercial work and did the deals. And I promised my board in KLC at the time that I would do it for 10 years. And to the day, I pretty much resigned on the day um, after 10 years of of giving what I realize now is you're giving your time, you're giving periods of your life to the cause. And it, it came at the end of that, I started to realize I also need to be an example of running businesses um, and set up a, a nest egg for myself and my family, um, but do it in a way that's an example to other Indigenous people, Aboriginal people around the country, about you can run big businesses and be successful. One of the one of those business uh, ventures that has been a constant focus, I think, for the sounds of it, since you moved in that direction, was obviously with respect to pastoral stations. Yeah, and it, I, I'm assuming that goes back to those the very sort of inception of what you said before, where it is where you know Aboriginal people had their land taken off them given largely over to pastoralists for the most part, particularly in your, your family's part of the world, and now going back to the, going back and, and then acquiring pastoral stations once again and, and, and bringing them all together, stitching them all together for the benefit of the, the broader you know, Indigenous community, I suppose. Why, why is it the pastoral stations for you have become such a, a signifier of, of importance economically? Yeah, the pastoral stations were like part of our DNA, right? My father... Um, had me working on pastoral stations. My great grandfather, um, for Gentius or Yulia, he um, worked on pastoral stations. He drove cattle from Halls Creek down to Mikathara and then rode on to Bindoon, um, where he caught up with the monks who grew him up in Pargo Mission, um, that is Columbaroo up in the North Kimberley. And so um, my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother worked on pastoral stations. All our families have these connections. That was when they were, when my family members were taken away to Beagle Bay Mission and growing up, they were trained to be domestics to work for pastoral stations or, or different people. Um, and I had this strong feeling because even when I was a boilermaker or when I was trying to run my own contracting business on pastoral stations, that if people had a job, you have more meaningful impact in your life and you're proud of it. So I wanted to also incorporate cultural values into the workforce because I could see that if we didn't start working with a cultural lens, that the cultural values will be lost. Like in my days from Calac when I ran around in the KLC, I would kill kangaroos, goannas, turkeys, catch fish, trade it with 
other, uh, you know, as gifts, bring it to other people because that's what I was taught in Calais is when you meet senior people, you need to bring a gift. And so bush food was something everyone valued. So, you know, on the way to a meeting, I'd shoot a turkey, hand it, give it away, um, trade a turkey for some turtle or dugong and give it, trade it, give it to someone else, uh, just consistently like that because I did do some academic reading and research and it talked about when an economy or a region gets a lot of jobs, if you don't have traditional goods to continue to maintain your cultural connection, it changes. And so there were some studies in Canada where they analysed the trading between different houses in a village or community and that the invent the big intervening event was a mine and that people started buying meat from a supermarket and it changed the nature and the relationship people had because they there was no moose or caribou to trade or beaver to be to maintain those cultural connections and that's what capco is capco has it's a cultural block we all practice the same traditional law and custom um, we're running it in a a uh, melting pot of cultural values and Western commercial values because we've got to be profitable, um, trying to respect everyone and develop a very profitable station. And by controlling the land, like no one backed us. State government didn't back us. Commonwealth didn't back us. We did get a little bit of money from Nigel Scullion um, to help out with some infrastructure, but that was pulling teeth to get that. But thank goodness he gave some support. But ultimately, we had to, my native title group, Wallaluku PBC and Marawara Aboriginal Corporation all both put in a million dollars each in. And we kicked off with three cattle station under one umbrella. And then we got the fourth station back from the Indigenous Land Corporation, the ILC, it's ILS, Land and Sea Corporation now. Um, and one, a, a tragedy happened in that process, and that is the ILC made us buy the cattle. Even though they got the land and the station under the, uh, out of dollars from the Commonwealth Government under the land fund that Paul Keating set up for social justice package to help get back land, they had some weird policy where they made Aboriginal, where we're the only group in Australia that had to pay for the stock on their land. Um, a head of cattle. A head of cattle. So it put Capco in serious debt, and we're still managing that. It's tough, um, but we did it on our own feet. We're, we're in negotiations with the ILSC now to try and recognise that and treat us the same as every other group in the country. Um, so anyway... We've gone from what probably was about 4,000 head of cattle with three stations to 40,000 head of cattle with four stations um, in the space of eight years, uh, probably six and a half years where we hit the sweet spot. Um, ability to control our own destiny, employ Aboriginal people. Um, yeah, no, it's a very successful story. I've caught up with other people who invested in it and what it taught me about Aboriginal businesses and investing was that there's another hidden discrimination is traditional owners cannot get access to capital. We couldn't borrow money and use the land, even though we have a Western land tenure, they're, um, a partial lease, the banks won't lend us money against that because they don't want to be seen kicking traditional owners off their traditional land which means we get access to a lot less capital. So it requires a different sort of investment vehicle to support Aboriginal partial stations to get up and running because all we could borrow against is the herd and they only, they lent us 40% of the herd value at the time. And it was a slow burn. It, it taught us a lot about managing the dollars really tight. It's still tight, but... It just doesn't sound fair, right? Whereas the next door neighbour station, still on our traditional land, can go to the same bank and borrow 
50% of the land and stock value. So their ability to get to scale and production is a lot quicker and faster than us because we only can get access to half of our assets value. You've you've come from a background where your family's been, you know, your family's got members of the stolen generation. You struggled yourself with reading and writing, went on to become a boilermaker, then a lawyer and chief executive. You have a, a tenureship as well, the University of New South Wales, I think it is, um, business owner now. As you settle into this sort of part of your life where you're looking at that next step of Aboriginal economic development, meaningful economic independence for Indigenous people. Having gone through such a significant legacy and your family's journey in the Kimberley, what do you see next are the most important challenges for Australia or the Indigenous community specifically in the country to make sure that the next Wayne Bergmans that come through, I suppose, have seen such a significant change and and can bring about their own change for the benefit of, of the broader community? Look, I think the the next step is that we need more support within Aboriginal groups about supporting individuals to be more successful. The old antage of, you know, the the crab story, the crab trying to cry, clam out, out of the bucket and someone, another crab trying to pull them down is still real and strong. So the the more successful Aboriginal businesses... Like philanthropy, we have to go to all the non-Indigenous business to ask for philanthropy to help us, whereas I'd like to see that we're going to Indigenous businesses for more philanthropy um, because when you're, when you're an Indigenous business on the ground, you know where to put the dollars to make the best impact if you want to create change. Otherwise, we're just creating the historical legacy of someone knows better than us. I think the very disappointing, the voice, but I think it was a poorly executed campaign. So we shouldn't be surprised in the outcome. I I think that we should take stock of it and put away any money that's been unspent in that process invest it and wait for the next leaders to come along. I don't like saying this, but I think the opportunity has been lost during my lifetime to get recognition. There may be an opportunity to do treaties. There's forms of that being negotiated in Victoria and and different other places. Um, but the the biggest change that I think should happen is Aboriginal people shouldn't be negotiating with industry directly about impacts on their country, that these decisions should be between the state, the sovereignty of the state and the Commonwealth should be settling these questions because it creates it creates a model where this, the it becomes a legal issue and the companies are trying to create the economic power, but the real decision makers is the state. But they're nobody, they're not seen to be able to set the minimum standards or benchmarks. And they say, when you have under-resourced opponents, of course the opponent with more resources is going to get a better outcome because they can pay for better outcomes. So there's a inequity and injustice in that. So... I'm hoping that the Australian public will understand that by having minimum benchmarks in agreement making, that everyone will do better. Industry will have more certainty. Aboriginal people will have more certainty. And the Australian public, the consequence of having traditional owners with better agreements and better outcomes, participation, you'll see better social outcomes and there'll be less spending from the government purse on training and opportunity. You pay for it, what I call at the front end where the development's happening, not waiting for profits or taxes from those projects to go back to treasury and then someone 
prioritizing for our own good how they should spend training money for Aboriginal people. We should be dealing with these things at the front end. So I'm, I'm hoping there'll be greater understanding and if anything from The Voice that we have more processes of truth telling and it opens the real debate and The Voice was only a step to getting towards the treaty. Wayne, thank you very much for joining us here today. And thank you for joining us for another episode of Indigenous Insights with the National Indigenous Times. Wayne Bergman's book, written with Madeline Dickey, is available at bookshops across the country and online. It's called Some People Want to Shoot Me. And thankfully, Wayne, that didn't happen at all while you've joined us, and I appreciate your time here today. Thank you. <laughs>